And before I get on to Canada's economy, let's take a look at what the news is out of Greece, because it was just announced today, July 17th, 2015, that they are getting a bridge loan. Thank God they're going to get some money. You've seen their banks have been closed. People have been photographed, crying in the streets. Pensioners can't access money, and they are going to get a bridge loan. The only thing with this is that the bridge loan is coming so that on Monday, Greece can make its payment to the European Central Bank. So they get it with one hand and give it back to the other. And by the way, with all those billions and billions of bailout money, that has been what's been happening, is they get it with one hand, and with the other hand, they got to give it back to the banksters. In the meantime, the Greek people have all sorts of austerity now being shoved down their throat, on top of the austerity they have already faced, including having to sell some of the beautiful Greek islands and taxation rate hikes and all these different things. Nothing changes. Now on to Canada, because lots of things have changed in Canada. I mean, you know, a couple of weeks ago, months ago, our loonie was up at, what, 82, 83 cents to the U.S. dollar. And now it's back, as of this morning, below 77 cents to the U.S. dollar. Now, it, it's only pennies, but when you take a look at pennies, they add up. And we're talking about, what, a 7, 8, 9% drop in the value of the Canadian dollar in just a few weeks. And if you think any of these bozos have a handle on the economy, that somehow they're going to be able to change it around, when they get elected, and by they I say one of them is going to be the new prime minister. It could be the old prime minister, it could be one of the new prime ministers. But if you think that they have control over Canada's economy, wake up. You know, I used to think that anyone could become a politician, but I tell you, right now, I don't subscribe to that notion. Most of us grew up in decent families where we learned about how to answer questions. Have you ever seen how politicians avoid questions? You can ask them a hard question and they will skirt and dance around it, reciting their talking points. And the reason is, is that politics is completely gone awash. I, I'm not going to say crooked because that's, uh, you know, could be inflammatory to say it's gone crooked, but it sure the hell isn't working for people. And it doesn't matter if you take a look at Greece, you take a look at the United Kingdom, where austerity is being shoved down people's throat by Cameron, and who has just been revealed to be secretly uh, engaged in bombing raids in Syria, even though the parliament was against it, to Canada, where people think that, you know, everything that's happening, man, Man, you know, Harp, Harper said, Canada's economy is in a downturn. Who could have predicted that? I mean, certainly not our economists, not our Bank of Canada. I mean, who could have seen that Canada's economy was going to be in for a little shakeup? Well, I found stuff in May that was talking about what's happening today. 53% of the TerraNet index for home prices in Canada are from Toronto and Vancouver. That's because they're so big relative to the size of the economy. So even though we're seeing weakness in other places, uh, Montreal is an example, uh, Calgary I told you about, and also in uh, Edmonton, we're still seeing uh, uh, big increases in Toronto and Vancouver and people being priced out. A lot of foreign money is coming into those places. In particular, uh, Chinese money has been playing a big part in terms of pushing up house prices in places like Vancouver. Indeed, we were just talking about that the other day. Uh, well, I want to ask you, what exactly is the Canadian government doing right now to sort of rectify the situation and, and really reverse course so it doesn't uh, get any worse? Well, the Conservative government there is a very market-oriented to government, so they're not going to look to do any sort of massive stimulus. The only thing that can happen, therefore, is that interest rates will go lower. So there you have it. From May 22nd, Canada has nothing else up its sleeve but dropping interest rates. Our housing market is being uh, fueled by Toronto and Vancouver, and it's all a false uh, thing. As a matter of fact, yesterday I got really ticked off at CBC National, which is an ongoing thing with me. Uh, they had Amanda Lang on, and they were talking about the drop in the Canadian dollar and how this is going to impact two of our major things. And one has to do with the housing market in Toronto and Vancouver. And the fact of the matter is, is that Toronto and Vancouver, 
Vancouver's housing market isn't being driven so much by local people as it is by foreign investment. And those people are coming in with cash and uh, they're still driving up the price of homes, which does nothing to add to our economy. If you have a house that sells for, you know, two million dollars uh, in May and it's resold for two point five million in October, that half a million bucks increase is not adding any jobs. It's not adding anything to Canada's economy. It's not. But the other thing that really ticked me off is Amanda Lang said that some Canadians did the right thing. That was her exact words, right thing, because they were saving back in the good old days. And now what's happening is with the lower interest rates, well, they're not getting all that money on it. So this could impact uh, retirees greatly. Well, it's not about doing the right thing, dear Amanda. The fact of the matter is, is that if you go back to the 70s, when things were more normal, when banks behaved more normal, when housing prices was more normal, our parents could buy a house. It, chances are it's paid off. Uh, some people even had multiple homes, all paid off, because those days the houses were like twenty, thirty, forty thousand bucks. So what happened is that they got their wealth the old-fashioned way, and now you know they're living off that in retirement because they put it into different uh, uh, bonds and stocks and whatever, whatever they did. You know, they might have just kept it in cash in the bank and collected interest on it, because at one time the banks paid interest. You know what happens today? The banks borrow at 0.5% uh, of uh, rate, and then they re-lend it to you at a much higher rate. And heaven help if it gets into stuff like credit card debt, uh, cars, etc., etc. That's why Canadian household debt is at record high. And young people, young people starting out life who have student loans and who have uh, families to start cannot afford to get into a housing market where the average house now starts in Vancouver, what, at a million bucks? That's an av that's not even a fancy house. We're talking sometimes about teardowns being a million bucks. And even if you come into the sunny Okanagan, you know, half a million dollars for your average home. My parents moved here in the 80s and they could buy a house for well under $100,000. As a matter of fact, their neighbor's home sold for just in the 60s and it had an in-ground pool for Pete's sakes. So a lot of things have changed. It's not so much that our parents did the right thing. It's that they lived in the right time. And that has changed. Today, we've been taken over by the banksters and by crooked politicians. And I am going to say crooked politicians because that's what it seems like to me. And things are not going to improve. And here's the other big secret about politics. No politician is going to tell you that they don't have an answer. That things are not going to get better because that doesn't get them elected. You know, they get up onto this platform and they talk, oh, I got the plan. I have that plan and people stand around you know their eyes are glazed lit up like little stars clapping applauding opening up their checkbook and writing a donation whatever they don't have a plan if you think that Canada can act in the economy in the world on its own that somehow uh, a new government the old government whatever can turn things around it ain't gonna happen our economy is going to be hurt a lot more. And this is, like I said, why I could never be a politician. Is I'm going to say how it is. First of all, let's take a look. Yesterday we had the Premier's meeting. And Saskatchewan Premier talking about Canada's resource industry. Oh, we got to support the resource industry. You know, forget a lot about the environmental concerns. We need the pipelines heading all over the place because it's about energy, energy, energy. Look. We have uh, Iran coming online, and there's a lot of information about the energy that they're going to be creating, not only oil, and they have apparently excellent quality oil. And now to get his expert insight on oil, Marin Katusa is on the show. Marin is the chairman of Katusa Research and the author of The Colder War, How the Global Energy Trade Slipped from America's Grasp. There is already a glut of oil today driven by record output in Saudi Arabia and continued high output in the U.S. Of course, that's keeping oil prices very low. So I first asked Marin what kind of impact we should expect on the markets now that this deal is going through. Here's what he had to say. Well, definitely Saudi Arabia is not happy about the, the support being pushed towards Iran from a 
you know, from America and its allies, nor is Israel. But what no one's really talking about is how Saudi Arabia is actually at its all-time highs for production. It's all about international market share. Saudi Arabia is well aware of a couple of things that the media hasn't yet quite picked up on, and I'm glad you guys asked this question is, you know, first of all, everyone's talking about can Iran bring production online? Well, yes, they can, but what about existing onshore storage? You know, Iran has anywhere between 25 to 50 million barrels of storage that they can start leaking into the market, the international market, and that's cheap oil. Uh, and let's not underestimate what technology can do to the Iranian oil. The, uh, the Iranians are very sophisticated, and once that floodgate opens, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, they're very well aware of what's going to happen here. And it's not just oil. Remember, Iran has world-class natural gas deposits. So uh, the rest of OPEC is very worried. And, and, and look, I make my living managing my funds. I'm an oil guy. I'm a commodities guy. And this is very bearish for oil. Okay. Well, what kind of impact should we expect uh, more specifically on the oil markets when this deal goes through? Well, let's talk in the near term. So there's a lot of questions yet where we are, but eventually in the near term, so when I say near term, next six months, expect at least 400,000 barrels in the short term within the next six months to come from Iran to the international markets. So for example, in 2014, Iran only exported about 1.4 million barrels a day to the international market. Three years earlier, they were at about two and a half million barrels a day. So we see that, that, that differential of a million barrels. It will take them about a 12 to 18 months to catch up to that point. But in the near term, you'll see anywhere between 400 to 500,000 barrels a day hit the market. And remember, all of these Middle Eastern Gulf Arab states are fighting for that international market share. And yet, Russia is increasing production. And even China is increasing their own domestic production. So this is happening at a bad time for the price of oil, but it's a good time for the global economy. Well, Marin, as you know, I mean, the, the oil prices are already pretty low. So how much lower could they go as a result? Like I said on your uh, show a couple of weeks ago, I could see oil in the next six months touch down to the low 40s again. That's where my target price is. So let's say for a minute that Marin Katusha does know what he's talking about and the price of oil does go down again to the $40 range for any amount of time. What do you think that's going to do to Canada's economy? And here's the other thing that people have to understand is that we are competing with our oil with countries in the Middle East, with countries in Africa like Nigeria, countries in South America like Venezuela. None of them have the high wages that have been paid in uh, Alberta. You know, they, they don't have people People working for 70, 80, 90 bucks an hour being flown in with all the benefits and stuff like that. So how do you think the companies are going to figure out to compete against those oil uh, being brought in from other areas? We are going to see the wages and the benefits and everything cut. Or here's a simple truth. You either work for this or you don't work at all. It's that straightforward and simple but nobody wants to address anything in a straightforward simple language because while well, it, it just doesn't go that way you got to paint it up pretty and jobs are going to come back and the pipelines are going to go and we'll be pumping oil to china which i guess is increasing their production as a matter of fact did you know that russia has doubled the amount of oil it sends to china in the last few months just in the last few months with all these big sanctions on them. Look, I, I would love to be bull on oil right now, but I'm not, so expect lower for longer. Okay, and what's your timeline for how all of this gets done uh, for the sanctions deal? Look, I, I think it's going to take longer than most people expect because of Israel, because of Saudi Arabia. Remember, Obama's promise to veto any opposition within Congress. So all these things are going to take time. We're, we're entering an election year, so I don't think anything's going to happen as fast as the markets and the media would like to see it happen. But I think, let's say, 24 months before we get a real final resolution. And what countries do you think Iran might be looking to sell to? Well, definitely the, you're looking at uh, China's the number one. They've lost a lot of market share from China, so that's the that, that, like, that, that's the dragon everyone's paying attention to. So it's the emerging markets that Iran's looking towards. Well, you mentioned China. I mean, China obviously has a, a contract already set up with, with Russia. So how exactly would that uh, play into it? Saudi Arabia. 
So Saudi Arabia is very worried about their international market share, and Iran's going after Saudi Arabia's uh, international market share. So that's where the differential makes up. And let, let's not forget that Russia's doubled their exports to China in the last four months. So Russia's very important to China's future, and I think Iran is going to partner up closer to China's future, too. As far as I understand, uh, before the sanctions, Iranian deals generated low returns. It did not uh, permit the international companies to book reserves of oil in the ground, which of course are important to investors' uh, valuation of oil companies. Will Iran have to change the terms of its contract in order to attract new investment, and in what way? I think a good example of that is to look at what happened to Iraq and look at Kurdistan. So definitely they're going to have to open up, but I think you're going to first see the movement on the service companies. So look at Schlumberger, Halliburton, uh, the, the, the big boys with technology, uh, with infrastructure, equipment, people, the know-how, the technology, and the track record. So I think it's going to start with the service companies first, then you're going to see the big companies there. Uh, but also. You know, there's no shortage of money to bring in the Schlumbergers and the Halliburtons of the world. So that's where it's going to start. Uh, I expect they're going to have to open up the market because there's so many unknowns. But again, it's going to happen slowly. But, you know, these are world-class deposits. Look, I'm even queuing up to go to Iran. I want to check it out. When, when Iraq opened up, I was there. So uh, I'm very excited to what the potential. But it's not just oil and natural gas. People forget that Iran has world-class zinc and copper deposits, gold deposits. Th this land is going to see modern technology. This is a, a new threshold to open up. Uh, it, I'm very excited. Indeed, it's, it's a huge deal, huge implications here. Well, we can uh, certainly expect that multinational companies are already eyeing Iran as a market. Are there any specific companies uh, that might find investment in Iran right now very attractive? Well, definitely the service guys, so that's the first one because remember, they have to invest the equipment, uh, the, the, the management, the technology, the infrastructure there. So that's going to be the first guys that come in. Then definitely you're going to look at you know, the, the internationals, the big IOCs, the international oil companies, look at the big five. Chevron, definitely not shy to enter. Exxon, look for those. But I would also argue, let's look at the NOCs, the national oil companies. Expect Rosneft to come out. The Russians are very strong supporters of Iran. And, and our media here in the West is talking about how Iran and Russia are going to start quarreling over international market share. Nothing could be farther from the tr truth. So I think the first major oil deals that you'll see are actually going to be with the Russians. So let's see if I'm right on that. And I want to ask you also about uh, the quality of crude oil in Iran. I know that at one point it was considered to be higher quality than that of the U.S. Is that still the case today, or do we not necessarily know the state of Iran's oil? Well, we do. Uh, so you look at the results from previous, the, the, the formations, the geology, so it's not like it's uh, turned sour or heavy overnight. So this is high premium quality oil. And when you compare it to, say, Guajar's oil, I'd say it's a higher quality than the Saudi oil. So these are all very bullish aspects for Iran moving forward. This is high quality oil. There you have some of the facts and also predictions, you know, about what's going to be coming. It's, it's not a year or two. This could happen for the next decade. Uh, and I'm talking right now about Canada being impacted. Our tar sands does not have clean oil energy. It's expensive to produce. We're on a global market. There's more oil than ever. As a matter of fact, the United States is expected to be an exporter of oil by 2020. Shell has just moved a platform up along the west coast here to the Arctic to start drilling for more oil reserves offshore in the Arctic. All these things are going to be impacting us. And uh, the fact is, is that as we have pushed countries away, because Canada's Harper, I mean, he has pushed Iran away. He's pushed Russia away. He's pushing all these trading partners away. Well, they're not, it's not like in the old days when the colonialists could control everything and uh, ran the world. All those have changed. Russia and China are forming closer ties. And uh, politically, I mean, we all know that Russia has always stood by uh, Iran. For that matter, so has China. This isn't just an accident, you know, that things are stumbling around and look what's going to happen. 
So, uh, like I said, my prediction for the next 10 years is Canada's economy is going to be very bleak. We are going to have a big fall. We're going to have a big fall. When Cindy and I traveled in Florida a few years ago, we talked with people whose houses basically went from quarter million down to eighty, ninety thousand dollars you know, as the economy whacked. And I can see... Uh, that kind of drop happening across Canada. And sadly, I don't see any of the politicians addressing that, hey, we better batten down the hatches. We're in for a very rough ride. And uh, it's uh, it, get ready. It's going to get stormy out there. Instead, you know, like I said in the beginning, they're on their little soapboxes. You know, we're going to help the middle class. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. It's just more smoke being blown up where we don't need smoke blown up at least that's the way i see it